Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the 10th Distinguished Lecture of the Department of Informatics and the Laboratory for Computer Science and Informatics uh, at NOVA. So uh, we are very proud of being here today, not just because of our distinguished speaker, but as well because of the commemoration that somehow you'd like to, to make of the, about the 10th edition of uh, the Distinguished Lecture. So it has been a, a long way, and we have been kind of quite happy of the several speakers that we have been able to, to attract here to, to FCT and NOVA. And uh, uh, we think that this is some kind of initiative that we like to offer in first place to our students, okay? Because they, they'll be able to attend as, in the first per, as first persons to a lecture by one or several of the most distinguished researchers or practitioners in the industry in the field of computer science. Uh, and this is hopefully to be used by them as a source of inspiration for their future careers, either as engineers or, or researchers. Okay, so, so the distinguished lecture usually takes place once, uh, once a year, and this is quite essential for us so that you could really have this very, very spe spe special session featuring uh, just the topmost researchers in computer science. So uh, I'm going to, to pass the word now to Jean Leite, who is going to introduce the speaker, and later on, after the talk, share the, the Q&A session, okay? So thank you very much for being here. So good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for being here. Uh, Fernando Pereira, our distinguished uh, guest, is VP and Engineering Fellow at Google, uh, where he leads research and development in natural language understanding and machine learning. Uh, his previous positions include being Chair of the Computer and Information Science Department at the University of Pennsylvania, Head of the Machine Learning and Information Retrieval Department at AT&T Labs, as well as several research and management positions at SRI International. Fernando Pereira graduated in mathematics from the University of Lisbon uh, back in 1975, and he obtained his PhD from the University of Edinburgh in 1982. He has over 120 research publications on the areas such as computational linguistics, machine learning, bioinformatics, speech recognition, and logic programming, and several patents, all of which with over 60,000 uh, citations. But the impact of his work goes well beyond his scientific publications and their citations. From his role in early implementations of Prolog, very impactful, even if only known to a few in this audience, to systems such as Google Translate, Google Assistant, and even YouTube, his decisive fingerprint can be found in many places. He's a AAAI fellow, ACM fellow, ACL fellow, and former president of the Association for Computational Linguistics, the constant throughout his professional life has been his dedication to the problem of natural language processing in the broad area of artificial intelligence. And there are two sides that make this a fascinating problem. Well, there are certainly more than two sides, but there are two sides that I'd like to mention. The first one is that this is natural language processing, if not the hardest, certainly one of the harder problems to tackle in artificial intelligence. If you think about it, it, what it would take to be able to fully understand natural language, it quickly becomes clear how hard it is to solve that problem. On the one hand, natural language is rich enough so that it can be used to formally express all kinds of knowledge, including mathematical knowledge. So an AI fully capable of understanding natural language would have to understand all this. But at the same time, natural language is vague, imprecise, dependent on context and social conventions, doesn't always correctly follow grammatical rules, and amazingly, we can still understand each other. So an AI capable of dealing with it would also have to deal with all these sources of uncertainty. The truth of the matter is there is still a lot to be done to have an AI that fully understands natural language. But then there's another fascinating side 
uh, to natural language in the sense that it is probably the best window into the human mind. Not the only one. We have other forms of expression, such as music, the plastic arts, and we even have brain imaging. But natural language is probably the richest of them all. And this is why I'm quite excited about today's distinguished lecture, because we have the honor to have with us one of the, the very best on the AI area of natural language understanding, delivering this distinguished lecture on the relationship between language and the mind, namely by sharing with us his personal journey on addressing the questions of whether language mirrors the mind. Thank you for being here with us, Fernando Pereira. Thanks, João. Um, ao go into Portuguese for a minute. Muito obrigado por virem. Uh, é um grande honra para mim estar a dar esta uh, esta conferência e uh, uma oportunidade para refletirmos numa carreira que começou começou aqui em Portugal e que tem tem vindo por muitas muitas sinuosidades levar ao, ao, ao que eu vou discutir agora. Now back to English. So, um, first of all, I want to say that what, these are my opinions, my points of view, but they reflect a very large number of collaborators, friends, challengers, uh, and uh, I could not possibly put all the names here. What I've done is for, the, for those, uh, uh, those pieces of material for which I have a, a, a reference. I, I have references, I have a, set, a list of references at the end as well. Uh, but let me start with something that uh, goes back hundreds of years. Uh, recently, I was, I was preparing this, uh, this talk. Um, I came upon the, I actually searched Google for does language mirror the mind? I was curious what, what, uh, what uh, could be found. And I found a quotation uh, from quite a while ago. I really believe that languages are the best mirror of the human mind. And that precise analysis of the significations of words would tell us more than anything else about the operations of the understanding. This is Leibniz, uh, 17th century. So, I want to make a little parenthesis here that, that I think is interesting. Leibniz, of course, is most associated to, in our minds to two things. One is the cre creation uh, of the differential calculus as we practice today, as opposed to what Newton did, which uh, is, of course, the, what we think about, but is not the notation. He, he created the notation in the, the way of thinking of calculus as algebra, essentially. And the other side of, it, of this, which is very related, is that he always thought of reasoning as an algebraic operation, and that the reasoning as fundamentally operation on symbols. Um, so that was, in fact, much of the, not because I was influenced by Leibniz, and yet my um, philosophical education is not that great, but because I've been influenced by a number of colleagues, including uh, some who were very uh, fundamental in the creation of the, this department, uh, Luiz Luiz Pereira, Ilan Luiz Monteiro, uh, thinking about language in the context of logic and language as a, a language is meaning and la language processing by logical means, which essentially was the 20th century, late 20th century incarnation of the or attempt at bringing Leibniz to computational life. However, I'm not going to talk about that. I have another talk that I gave a few years ago where I started with that and then went into a new material. But because, I mean, there's only one hour, right? I, I had to, to uh, s avoid that temptation of going into that history, which is very interesting and uh, I will allude to later on. But instead, I'm going to go to someone else, Zelie Harris. Uh, this book was published in 1988, but in fact, these ideas come from the 50s. Harris was Chomsky's uh, thesis advisor at the University of Pennsylvania. And he had a very interesting, very hard to read, very important 
way of thinking about language in terms of information in information theory. In particular, you said, he, he, this is one of the quotes, one of the, my favorite quotes of his, in finding language that each word has a particular and roughly stable likelihood of occurring as argument operator with a given number of words. So what this is saying is, hey, words are in certain relationships in text, and in, per in performing that function, they have to be, uh, the, 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 there has to be a predictable way in which they do so, a statistical predictable way. Uh, and the other thing he used, he used this term that is not in this quote, uh, departures from equiprobability. What he meant was, you know, you can find distinctions between words of the, uh, in, and how the functions they perform and what they mean by looking how they change the probability of what you observe in a corpus of data. Now, Harris developed these ideas in the context of field linguistics. He was interested in going out into a, a population, maybe a, a literate population in, in so we, kind of traditional field linguistics that goes back into the 20s and th 30s and Boas and, and Sapir, and where you, you go and talk to the speakers, the native speakers of a language, and try to understand the structure of the language. And the only thing you can do is do essentially statistical analysis to figure out, oh, this phoneme occurs in this context and not in that context, and so on. And then interacting with the speakers, try to understand what the, what is the, the meaningful function of that unit that you are identifying. Now, partly, I mean, so I, I got very interested in the late 80s, this question of, can we look at statistics of words and figure out as word occurrences with other words and try to figure out something about their meaning. Uh, so another, so essentially, the computational implementation of Harris's program, if you will. Um, I was very taken by those ideas and I, I wanted, and I had started working in speech recognition and language modeling for speech recognition at the time. And, and so started looking at questions like, hey, if you look at the word, at the two words, that are related but different, like stocks and bonds, uh, which is very important right now because you see the market being in such convulsions, people are worried about should I move my, my savings from one to the other, things like that. Uh, you can ask the question, hey, how are they uh, connect, uh, co-appear with words like buy, hold, issue, own, purchase, select, and so on. You see that they have some similarities, you buy them and you sell them, but you also have some differences. You kind of choose the own stock, but you don't own bonds, I don't know why. Uh, you tender, uh, it tenders some a particular type of operation, which you really only do with stock, and, uh, and so on and so forth. So this, these distributions are different. So uh, at the time, back in 93, actually earlier than that, I had a, a very a brilliant um, intern uh, at Bell Labs, uh, as where I was then, Lillian Lee, who's now a professor, uh, has been a professor at, uh, at Cornell for a long time, and uh, Lillian and I started working on this, and, and coincidentally, trying to think about this problem, uh, and coincidentally, my, uh, you know, dear departed friend, uh, Tali Fishby, who was at Bell Labs at the time, a physicist, uh, uh, is a physicist, was a physicist by training as a condensed mass a physicist, but very, very uh, uh, deeply knowledgeable about statistical mechanics and information theory. So he started talking to me and to us and say, hey, you know, you, know, you can characterize the, the, the difference between these distributions in information theoretic terms. And I'm going to show some equations for one, for one or two slides, and I'm not going to try to explain them fully, but uh, if the easiest thing is so what, long story short, and in fact it was, it was a long story because then ev eventually also involved Bill Bialik, another physicist who's uh, at Princeton and, and, um, and, um, and, and Cooney, uh, is a very good friend of mine, uh, came up with this idea that when you look at words, so when you look at uh, normal information theory, you think about oh, the information con in notions of like entropy and so on, we'll talk about the information content of a signal, but no one really talked about information about what. I have, say, if I have the front page of the, a new, today's newspaper, 
I could, if I try to compress it using a standard compression algorithm, which is based on information theory, I, I don't, there's nothing that goes into that compression that depends on anything about the meaning of the page, of what's on the page. Whether it's the latest uh, football results or it is a war, you know, the algorithm doesn't care. It just sees which, how frequent are the words, how frequent are the characters, and just applies, you know, statistical methods to compress that. But the reality is that in, in, if we care about understanding, we care about information about something, the pro not the probability of an X of some kind, say, let me say here, of a noun, but rather uh, the probability of a verb given a noun. That is, the probability that if I talk about stocks, should I t do I talk about tender or not versus if I talk about gone. So we came up with a formulation, which is essentially information theoretic alternating minimization um, formulation says, hey, I, I want to create a representate a compressed version of say noun C that has a property that uh, is sort of trades off between the, the loss of information from between nouns in, the, in this compressed representation and the information that you maintain about the variable of interest, what we care about, in this case Y. And it turns out that there is a, a, very, a nice setup for that that has a, a, rec a, a recurrence set of equations and ultimately what happens is that we end up being able to cluster words according to the context in which they occur uh, where the similarity between words is measured by the KL divergence between the distributions of those, the context in which those words occur. So for example, this is actually, I did a much later, I, I, I re-ran those experiments from that paper like, you know, six years ago or so with much more data and so on and modern methods. And you, you, you know, you see for instance, you have uh, the, uh, the, this cluster is split in interesting ways, right? If I have say time and so on, we have, you spend time and you take time, but you, you know, things like project and case that have a temporal aspect to them, period and war, you don't really, you don't spend periods or don't spend temp, but you make them. And so same way on the ge geo side, you see things like city and country, so they set time and space, right? And then you see, oh, you know, cities, you leave and you visit and you, whereas uh, things like uh, bodies you make or, or, you know, you go to. And so, so there's basically the distribution of the verbs tells you something about the classes of nouns. So there's a little bit of, it's starting to smell that we know some, we kind of have concepts that underlie our vocabulary. But in a very, it's a very superficial way. Um, so that was a story. But um, those of us who work, started working on statistical methods in NLP, always challenged by our linguist friends, our former linguistic friends, say, hey, you know, you know, Chomsky said in 1957, that's all stupid. Because any statistical model for grammaticalness, these sentences, colorless green ideas sleep fiercely, and fiercely sleep ideas in green colorless will be ruled out on identical grounds as equally remote from English. Now, I can go for, I, I have a whole talk on why this is a fallacy, but I won't go into that. I will just point out that uh, in a paper in 2000, uh, which uh, was in a kind of a review paper that I, that I published for, with, for the Royal Society, um, I did a small, very small experiment. I said, look, the problem with that statement is that it, um, it proposes that any unseen event, any unseen string of words is uh, equally un impossible. But why? It's unseen, it's not impossible. So let's avoid that assumption by creating a model very simple model of successive words, W number prime, that factors to a, a latent, a random variable that says, oh, the probability of W prime given W is something like the probability of, you know, you know a factor to that variable sums as a probability of W prime given this hidden variable, the probability of the hidden variable 
given the, the previous word. Basically, z is a hidden variable. It's, a, it's like c before, although the mathematics is different. It basically says there's some kind of common class in the middle there that captures what's important about the relationship between w and w prime. Um, and not it, interestingly, if I use a model tri as trivial as that, it's get estimated by a method called expectation maximization. I won't go into that. You find that it can distinguish between the probability of the colorless green ideas and the, and the probability of previously sleep ideas. It, it's you know five orders of magnitude. It's quite the difference. And you can you can do this experiment in many different ways. It always comes out reasonably well. And um, so all of these things I tell you something which is clearly this depart this uh, probability statistical view of language has some traction. Now, having said that, uh, there is an older writer that says something that I want to call out because even though the previous pieces work, I kind of agreed with this, they, they actually, they didn't go far enough. So if I think about the, con so Firth was a, a lexicographer and descriptive linguist from the 30s, and I mean, I don't know his work very well, but I, I know this famous quote of his in the, this article actually that, uh, uh, the complete meaning of a word is always contextual, and no study of meaning apart from a complete context can be taken seriously. Now, the context of co-occurrence of a word in the two pieces of work that uh, I talked about before is not just a single word. It's the entire context. It could be not just the document of occurrence was in, but actually the social context in which that document was produced, and so on. So we cannot stop at saying, well, can we organize our what our lexicon to try to induce, to try to see the meanings and the concepts, what's in the mind behind those words, just from a single association, whether it is the, follow, the pre preceding word or in a grammatical construction, say the relationship between nouns and verbs or whatever it may be. So that wasn't enough. And in a sense, the, this point is the point at which uh, I kind of got a bit stuck with language modeling. I, so I had worked on language modeling for speech recognition. I worked on these two studies. I have some other work on, uh, on uh, uh, cluster-based language models. But we, we draw, drew a blank because it was really hard to capture this notion of the complete context. How do you can capture the complete context? Certainly not with the probabilistic models, simple probabilistic models with the single random variables or small number of random variables that we have shown before. And because of that and other career decisions, I, I kind of stopped working on this kind of problem uh, for a long time. You know, fast forward to 2017. At this point, I have a kind of different role uh, so I, I, I was managing by then a fairly large team at uh, Google Research working on natural language. And uh, I was, uh, had the great fortune, I have the great fortune of having amazing people in that, in that team. And, uh, and there were two, two in the particular individuals which are co-authors in these two papers that I list there. One is Jakob Luskorait, who's actually now doing something completely different in, uh, in, in uh, bioinformatics. Uh, but, and the other one is uh, Jacob Devlin, who is the, the lead author in the Burt paper. And what they, you know, and so there are two key things that came to pass in between 2000 when I was thinking about these things and, uh, and 2017. Maybe one is that I wasn't paying attention so I was not confusing everybody. Um, the other one is that my friends uh, who had for many, many decades struggled to convince the rest of us that neural networks could do something uh, had the last laugh. And they had the last laugh because GPUs came about, right? You know, it, my theory of, uh, of neural networks is, you know, they were made possible by GPUs. If they, uh, and in fact, 
I argue that their current structure and the current uh, uh, strengths and weaknesses all come from being implemented on GPUs. I can have, the, in Q&A, I can tell you why I think this, but not now. So anyway, um, attention is all you need is this brilliant idea, it's super simple, but it was like when you see it, you say, what, why did they do that? I, I remember being sitting in a cafe in Palo Alto having uh, with uh, Jacob one day, and he said, I have this, we have this great new thing to tell you about, and he started describing this in, in, with his hands, no paper or anything, and I'm like, it, that's not possible, that's not going to work, and they say, no, it's not, and then I realized that you know, eventually I realized, not pretty quickly, that this was like a transformational idea, idea and it's called transformer. I know, sorry for the pun. Which is the following idea. You know, just take any piece of text. And I'm very fond of the old ca crazy car cat cartoon. Uh, and so I always, sometimes use examples from that. There's actually a nice Amer US stamp of, uh, of uh, Ignatz, who's the, the, the the mouse throwing a brick at crazy, the cat. This happens a lot in the, in the cartoon. And so Ignatz threw a brick at cat. So suppose that I, I, have, I have a model essentially made of a cascade of blocks. I put two, but could, typically they are like 10, 20, 30, whatever, whatever people use, with additional stuff that I won't go into. And you're going to do two things. One is to say, I'm going to have a model that allows, you know, take the words, each word is mapped to a vector, and the, 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 the mapping is something that's learned by, uh, by uh, stochastic gradient descent. And then its vector goes into a neural network whose job it is to look, essentially for each, each word position, look around at all the other words and incorporate information from them in a, in a, teach, in a learnable way. And so you can think of that word as paying attention to the other words, attending to the other words. The technical details are interesting, but I won't go into them. But this is what they call self-attention. And uh, so this idea had actually came about before the Transformers by a, a work of other, you know, Jak, uh, um, uh, Jakob Luskerich and others, and Kuperik and, and several others. But uh, basically, this idea of self-attention allows essentially horizontal propagation of information in between the different words, the representation of different words. And then above that you have a bunch of feed four neural networks, multi-layer perceptrons that turn the output. Of course, these arrows go through, a, this arrow is a big vector, it's, a, you know, it's, not, it's not a single number. Uh, this, uh, and scrambles that in a certain way, Compu learns essentially a new fun a function that knows, oh, if I have this, this information, then here's how I might pre-process it for the next layer of attention. And, and the way I train this for, in the BERT case, are different ways of training it, is to say, I, I mask a particular word at random and try to predict it. So I mask brick there, and the data be that at the corresponding position, this thing is going to be able to predict brick. So I can take, any large amount of text and turn it in training data for something like this. Now, m many of you know that this idea, simple as it is, have many technical details to make it e easier to say than to do, actually, ha had incredible impact. In, uh, you know, in fact, you know, one of the biggest ranking signals in, in Google search today is based on, on the transformer model. Um, a base, uh, you know, basically a BERT type model. Uh, and it's successful. You can also, with models like this, you can essentially encode tasks in this form. Right? You can take, for instance, a, a, you have a question in a paragraph, you try to say, does the, the, there's an answer, is there an answer in that paragraph of that question? You can encode it as a, one of these sequence problems between, but adding some separator symbols and then essentially training in the same way and then trying to predict with which span is its input is the start and end of the answer. And this is actually quite effective and uh, again, we use it in variants of this in products. Uh, so for instance, if you have, and th this is some old data from uh, the types of success you can have with a model like this. Uh, and 
and I'll send just an example, okay, which is, you know, how fun this star is Jacksonville from Miami. And if you look at this paragraph, it's pretty long. And, uh, you know, if you look at Jacksonville and Miami are quite far apart, and in the text, and it's not clear that far, the word far doesn't appear anywhere there, right? Uh, it just says, but there's a distance there, and somehow, you know, this thing correctly predicts the correct distance, even though it has never been trained to detailed parse this sentence and try to say, does this say how far it is? No, it's basically the transformer model is able to incorporate information horizontally and vertically in ways that allow it to learn how to read, essentially how to read text to satisfy a task like this. So, um, so this is quite interesting, and we, you know, there's been a huge industry of work along these lines, and, and uh, many, many, many successes. Um, however, there's this kind of a, a troublesome aspect to it, and let me give an example. Is this, are we just basically doing great associative, so we, going back to language and mind. Now, we, all, we happen to, I'll go into a little bra uh, bracket here because, uh, so we not, not, normally we like to think that we're not just kind of reacting associatively to stimuli. We're not like, you know, uh, slime molds. We are humans, you know, we can reason. And uh, so we are always afraid we can build, build any AI system based on these techniques. That, oh, AI, it's great at doing associations but it's terrible at reasoning, right? That's, that's, and that's why many, many very good researchers, starting with John McCarthy, you know, assume that the underpinnings of mind, and, and really starting with life, because the underpinnings of mind is lo a logical machine, something that operates by a fixed set of rules that are crisp, that are undefeasible, that are all that we need to know about proper reasoning. Um, and now, I'll just, the, the kind of snide remark I'll make here is, it's not so surprising that you think this, because if you think about the people that started AI, they were all mathematicians, electrical engineers, some philosophers. They all saw that kind of formal reasoning as the highest form of being. They, you know, they knew how to solve equations. They were highly influenced by John von Neumann. Just finished re reading a, a wonderful biography of John von Neumann. And there, his influence on the starting, start of AI is quite significant. Um, and even though it's not written down directly, although he has this famous book which was edit, you know, edited after his death called The Compute, Computer in the Brain. And um, uh, so, Anyway, that is kind of a historical, cultural remark. Uh, but let's look at an example. Uh, so you look at something like this. Who was the first person to see Earth in space? As far as I know, this is still a search result we get. And Yuri Gagarin. Now, you see, look at that passage. Oh, ooh, no, wrong button. See, it's not real. That passage doesn't show anything about seeing anything from space. Uh, first of all, is space and outer space the same thing? So remember, you went to outer space there. Is that the same thing as space? Yes, maybe. Was there, now, you hear obvious questions, like, was there a window in the Vostok? Maybe there wasn't. Maybe it was in there, it was in space, but he couldn't see out, right? It could he actually look out and see the Earth? Maybe a window is pointing out to the moon, right? We don't know that. Um, so there's this question of what is a justified belief? How do we think about justified belief? Now, of course, our logicist friends will say, oh, you know, you have to have a set of a set of axioms, you have any kind of rules of inference, and you know, you, then you either, it either follows or it doesn't follow. But natural language is not like that. There's all sorts of, you know, vagueness, as, as, as Rose pointed out, right? So in this case, outer space and space. There's a little bit of a mismatch, but maybe it's not an important one in the context of this particular question and, and answer. Um, so some folks in my team uh, uh, in 2019 
um, actually collected a very large number of these question answer pairs derived from actual Google, you know, searches that people have run against, uh, against Google that had Wikipedia answers and produced this uh, data set, natural questions that many people have been using for question answering experiments. Um, and it's set them thinking about, hey, how can we think about identifying in a question answer pair this chain of reasoning, like the Jacksonville example I gave before, a chain of reasoning that led to uh, that particular answer. Uh, let's see, okay. Uh, so, so here's a, a, so, and the result of that, those investigations is another paper that this similar subset of people, not exactly the same, but a road called QED, a framework for data set explanations and question answering. Uh, so here's a question, how many seats in the University, uh, in the University of Michigan Stadium? Here's a passage from Wikipedia. And, uh, and here's a plausible answer. Official capacity is 100,007, 601. So short answer, yeah, probably that. So what, what is happening here? How can you have characterize what's happening here? So one thing you can do is to think about, hey, is there a sentence that actually has the answer? You know, actually, yes. Uh, and then, it, is there, it, does that sentence involve what we're asking about? In this case, the University of Michigan Stadium. Is there a reference to that entity in the sentence? Yes, there is, but it's a pronoun. It's official capacity. Now, so there's, there's a, a little bit of com grammatical complexity there. Um, and then, does it follow? There's a question follow. If X is official capacity is Y, does it, is that, does that imply how many seats in X is, which is what you're asking about in Y? And, uh, and so, so now, given something like, given the sort of thinking about what question answering, at least the basic question answering might look like, you can start saying, hey, can I collect a set of data like this, uh, annotated by people, by uh, experts that allows us to evaluate the quality of question answering and even train the system for question answering. Turns out that doing this task is pretty hard for humans. Uh, it turns out know, it's really remarkably difficult to come up with a set of annotation guidelines, and you will read in that paper, that capture, the, that capture all the variants, even in the simple set of like examples like this, there's all sorts of things that can go wrong and difficult to, ex to instruct even expert annotators how to do the right choices in a case like this. Nevertheless, they were able to create a really nice data set and do some basic baseline experiments. But it speaks to the, the very fundamental difficulty here, which is, and it goes back to logic, right? You know, I could imagine looking at a, a case like this and formalize it say in terms of the logic and, uh, and, uh, and then use a theorem prover to answer it. But it would be quite a slog. You know, even things like official capacity and how many seats. Well, do we know that, you know, all the, all the official capacity seated to, maybe there's some standing only area. So, or, uh, so they are not seats, right? They may be, maybe people, sit on the grass, uh, you know, those are not seats officially, but they're still there, right? So there are all sorts of these complicated, defeasible matches that are very, very hard for us to formalize, but which human language users do all the time. Now, if from a Leibnizian point of view or John McCarthy point of view, if you cannot formalize it, you don't, it's not in your head. It's just, you know, you know your mind is, a mach is like an algebraic, you know, calculator. So if it's not formalized, you, you, you're in trouble for achieving those results. But as language users, we kind of pretty much do this. You know, if someone was an exam was giving this a test, say use a kind of English as a, a second language, they would come up with that number and they would be graded correct, right? Uh, so there's a kind of mismatch and a gap between what we do as we use language 
and what, at least the idealized view of what minds contain. Now, is that a kind of, and I'll come to the end of why, what my current beliefs about this mismatch, this junction are, but for the time being to say that even doing this task, which requires the annotators to be somewhat more formally minded, is hard. So is there another way to go? Uh, and uh, so I, I, by the way, I forgot this clicker here. Uh, so let's give another example. Can I have a model follow the inference chain out like this? And I'll just give another example here which shows Compli how complicated this gets. Another, uh, this is the, another uh, natural question data set example. Where did the captain sleep on the main flower? Up on the main deck is the stir uh, in the stern was the cabin for Master Christopher Jones. Now, captain and master, huh? Well, you would have to know, if you wanted to formalize this, that master was the, the title used for the for, for ships that were not too big in, in England, somehow they would, you didn't have a captain, you had a master. Uh, the other thing is the cabin for the master. Maybe the master really hated the cabin and slept in the, on deck, who knows, right? We don't know that. Uh, but, you know, a, a reasonable answer is, so the question, where did the captain Slap my flower and say, somehow, first of all, number one, the captain, master Kester Jones, there's an identity that is defeasible, but it's true in this case, and out on the main deck in the stern, right? Uh, that's where he slept, you know, my, I mean, actually in that cabin. Uh, so, again, could such a chain of reasoning we certainly, it's kind of hard to think of how you could imagine a formal system capture all the shadings of, you know, sloppy, sloppy matches between master and, you know, if you know history of the English Navy, you'll know, okay, they really mean the master. But you know, most of us don't, right? Um, but still, people do this kind of task all the time, even if they don't quite know exactly what words mean. I still remember learning how to speak English, read English, you know, and one of the things that I did, and I'm sure all of you who are not English, native English speakers did, is be reading something, say, say some technical book or paper, there's a word you don't know what it is, but you kind of fill it in and say, oh, this mean, must be a whatever. And then maybe if you are really dedicated and a, and a hard student, you go and go and check in the dictionary, but of course half the time you don't because you just couldn't move on, right? You need, you need to read a chapter for the exam or something. So, but, so the question here is, hey, this is hard in the, in the sort of McCarthy, Leibnizian way. Is there a way that make it easier for machines? So before that, I'm going to go on a riff. This is actually work that's not been published yet. Uh, the paper is going to be out in archive tomorrow. Some, some other group that reports to me and they work on a different topic, a different thing, which is creating captions for images. It's a very active area of research. Lots of people work on it. And one of the, so the question is, can I provide, you know, good descriptions of complex scenes? Look at this scene, to among, you know, this is a caption it generates, uh, this, uh, this unpublished thing. I, I was hoping it would be out today, so I was going to put the, the link there, but it, it isn't out yet. It's great, hey, you know, clearly they got it. This thing can figure out, can watch the, look at the image and say, oh, monkey number one, monkey number two, three tongue, hold it, oh, it's great. Well, not so easy. There's another one. A view of the ocean from a boat. Where is the boat? You know, so how did it infer that there was a boat there? We can surmise that the, the view doesn't show any land with the cam from the point of view of the camera. So one inference that a statistical model might make is, well, you know, pictures like these are always from a boat. You know, there are many captions we say, you know, a picture of the, of the, you know, the beautiful 
you know, algar uh, beach from the, our robot or whatever, you know. Uh, but uh, it's jumping to conclusions. How, how can we deal, how can a system like this support their information? And many, of, many people that work in, in machine learning and AI these days get very nervous about this type of thing. They say, well, you know, this, how, this thing comes out of the conclusions. How can we explain itself, explain yourself, justify your, your reason, you know, how do you thought there was a boat in here? And a tendency in the field has been many people, most often people coming up from sort of more formal mathematical backgrounds, like to think of this as, hey, uh, show your work. Hey, neural network, point to the units in the network that activated, explain how a boat came, off, come, came about here. But that's a really tall order. Think about asking your own brain which neurons fired when you misinterpreted the scene and they thought the boat was there that it was not. You know, it was actually a whale, right? It has happened to me, see something out in the water. Oh, it's a boat out there, but no, it's a boat, right? It's actually much more interesting than the other way around, right? If you think it's a whale, it's a boat. Um, so, um, so, while this is going on, the, the, our friends or s some subset of the same people, in fact, many more people, that uh, work with transformer type model said, you know, these things work pretty well in BERT. Can we make them bigger and see what happens? So two, there were two things that they did, and this is not just people at Google, there's people at OpenAI and the, and the Facebook slash Meta and many other places. Uh, including many in ac uh, academia. First of all, they say, can I use a transformer not for predicting a missing word, but actually to, for generating text? So, you know, what, I, what you basically do is take the transformer, so like Ignatz through well, and now you try to use the, pr the transformer to predict the next word. And you do something, you have to do something that's slightly tricky, the masking has to be structured to ignore the future, because you don't, you don't know what the future is, so you cannot be attending to a future you don't know. So there's a little bit of, uh, you know, uh, network surgery to make, neural network surgery to make sure that it only looks at the past. So you create these things, you know, ca called, they're called decoder-only models, and very, and very popular GPT-3 based on one, you know, all the GPTs are, uh, many other language modeling techniques are, you know, you, you know uh, and, these things are kind of interesting. You might say, hey, what is, to do, is able to do is just produce sequences of words. What, what's the big deal? You know, you just generate random text, not random because it has some structure, it has some coherence, but it doesn't, it doesn't have any kind of, it doesn't, it's not trying to say anything. It's just saying, you know, just kind of basically confabulating a kind of coherent, sort of locally coherent text. Well, so let's look at the latest effort along these lines. So this is Palm, uh, Pathways to Language Model. This is the work of how many people in, in our world, and it's like over 60, I can't remember everybody for sure. Some from my group, some from the, the brain group of people work a lot on the, the core neural network technology, some from other groups in, you know, all over the company in the research side. And uh, so this paper came just on, out on archive a couple of weeks ago, or maybe last week, I can't remember. And they decided to train a set of these decoder-only models of different sizes. These things are huge, right? In a, even the littlest one is 8 billion parameters. It has 32 layers, 32 of these transformer. Uh, it, uh, these things have heads, I won't go into this, but I, I'll just say one thing. I mean, the idea is, when you do this attention, you want to be able to segregate different aspects of the things that you found by attending to other words. So instead of having a single output, you have a separate number of outputs, what's called the heads, and then you concatenate them and then pass them to a, a kind of a, a linear transformation, a shrink set to a lower dimension to get into the next layer. So, uh, Basically, 
this is, you know, uh, and then, of course, for training these things, you, you train them for stochastic gradient descent with various kinds of very many tricks. It's actually quite hard to train these things for, for simply systems reasons. You know, computers go down, you know, uh, <laughs> Uh, high performance computing has race conditions sometimes. Uh, the other thing, other things I won't go into, uh, soft, you know, bugs. So the largest POM model is 540 billion parameters. Now, a pro that's parameters, these are floating point numbers, right? So it's a lot of bits. Uh, and there's actually a question, do I need all those bits of today? That's a, one of the big open questions. And, uh, trained on a collection of selected data, a bunch of conversations from social media, uh, a bunch of filter web pages, books, code, code, oh, interesting. Why code? Code is tech, right? Uh, Wikipedia and some news. You know, it's news is a very little. And here's how we use these things. Uh, you basically do prompting. What, do I, what is prompting? You start by saying, hey, what, here's what I'm, out, I'm about to do. I will explain how to make logical inferences. You know, and it, here's, I give an example. I give, it, actually, the prompt, I elided the actual prompt is from the paper. You can look in the appendix of the paper. Is, you know, there are two examples. You know, number two, Sam sees a piano on the subway, uh, in the subway station. Laughing, his friends prod him to play, saying, remember how amazing your rendition of Chopsticks was at the Christmas party? Can we infer that John majored in piano at Juilliard? Now, what? Well, really? No, I don't know. Uh, maybe I, I do know because I know the example. You know, so Juilliard is a top uh, school for music, as I know because a friend of mine has a student, uh, uh, their son, his son just been admitted to it. Um, and so someone who major in, in piano at Juilliard would be an extra piano player. Chopsticks is a very simple song to play on the piano. His friends were therefore likely being sarcastic when they told him to play, which would imply that Sam was not an extra piano player, so it's unlikely that Sam majored in piano at Juilliard. The answer is no. So this is the prompt. Now, this is not made by the machine, right? This is, a, this is my prompt. It's just me teaching the machine the kind of reasoning that I'm asking it to do. Now, so you give this prompt, and then you give another example. Here's the input. So you get the prompt, and then I get an input. Shelly's from Virginia, but is visiting that city with that famous market where they throw the fish. Going home next Tuesday. Question, is it likely that Shelly will be near the Pacific Ocean this weekend? Notice it's not a yes or question. Right? Now, uh, actually, this doesn't puzzle me because I didn't realize that the city with the famous market where they throw the fish is Seattle, Washington. I didn't know that. Uh, so there's a little bit of factual, a lot of factual information coded in these models as well. Seattle is on the Pacific Ocean. Shelly is visiting Seattle, so she'll be near the Pacific Ocean this weekend. The answer is yes. It's likely that Shelly will be near the Pacific Ocean this weekend. Now, if you saw a human do that, would you think they are thinking? You think they at least think? You think they understand? Pacific Ocean and uh, fish and market and so on? Probably. If you just given that without knowing it's being made by a machine. Uh, that's kind of disturbing, right? In a sense. Right? It, it, notice this thing has not been taught logic, has not been taught common sense, not been taught anything about the real world except it has been forced to learn how to compress a very large corpus. It's, it's just like a purely information theoretic objective, right? Compress this thing as much as you can, really. That's what these models are trying to do, because they're trying to predict the next word as well as you can on the training data, meaning you capture as much of the information of the, co the context as you can. You, you really being further here, right? You just capture all the information you can. And, but to do that, somehow the network, in its structure, in its weights, has to capture general patterns of behavior of linguistic behavior that, cap that, and if you think about the general patterns of linguistic behavior that we all use, many of them have to do with argumentation, explaining things to people. You know, many of you are teach, right? You have to explain things to the student, right? And explaining this in the sense, you, you give it, a, here's, you know, uh, why, you know, you know, present a question and then say, here's how you answer that question. 
and you go through a chain of reasoning. But the same model not, doesn't just do this. Look at that. Uh, with a different prompt, you have to do, give it the coding prompt, a few examples of, uh, the prompt is like the comment for a function, and then the, the, the answer is the code for the function. And I'll give, again, two examples, input output. Now, this is a very simple example. There are bigger examples, just the one that fits in the slide. There's, in the paper, there are some bigger examples, and there's, there's a whole set of paper coming out on this, and, uh, now, of course, OpenAI has done similar things. Um, so it figured out how to essentially create a bunch of variables that capture the different things that are going on here. So the cost of a pack of milk, uh, and uh, the, the cost of an apple, and uh, a, a total, and so on, and then the algebra that is needed to compute that. Uh, and, uh, and notice it has to compute, uh, you know, there's an, the unknown is not just how much it, uh, it tells you how much it paid, uh, um, but you have to do the division as well to figure out how many boxes of, uh, of pizza. How come, right? Now, here's, here's Naive Fernando. Uh, well, I mean, there are lots of wood problems on the web. Lots and lots. You know, it's, if you, again, if you're trying to compress that collection of word problems and, algebra, and all, all that code in with GitHub, you're going to create abstract patterns of operations. And now, now let me, you know, again, talking, oh gosh, we're about to run out of time, aren't we? I better get moving here. Anyway, if we think about how uh, sometimes people learn how to do algebra or coding by template matching, this is not so surprising for people, but the machine is done. And you can even explain a joke. Uh, and uh, I'll, I'll skip this, it's kind of a silly joke. Uh, but you know, again, there was a, a prompt for, with a couple of jokes, and here, give another joke. And it's just kind of word fun because pod is used internally to represent groups of this uh, tensor processing unit. And so whales, pods, you know, whale communicate pods. How can we do this? And finally, I mean, this is kind of crazy. This paper is amazing. Chain of thought prompting elicits reasoning in large language models. I mean, show that if you give reasons, like in these examples before, explain the re chain of reasoning, you, as the models get bigger, your power, reasoning power. Lambda is an early model also developed at Google. Uh, this uh, palm is the new one. It's like a one quarter of the number of parameters. It's phrased slightly differently. This is quite pretty striking how, how straight this grows with the size of the model. Now there's a lot, of course, a lot of scale as you might expect, but it's, it's not saturated yet. Um, but you need to do the explanation. You need to get the chain, the, the step, at least in the, uh, in, the, in the prompt. Then it figures out what to do. So, I, coming to the end. Um, so this is like, on one hand, you say, hey, you know, looks like language can get a lot of what we have in our minds, our, both the concepts and the inferential processes that allow us to reach conclusions, explain conclusions, et cetera, et cetera. But then, uh, you know, a little demon speaks on my left ear and says, hey, you know, you have to read this book. So a few years ago, I bumped, came across this book, I don't remember how, The Enigma of Reasoning. Two cognitive psychologists, Hugo Mercier and Dennis Perper, who do a, a brilliant job of surveying all what's known about human reasoning capabilities, which are very fallible, and trying to understand why they are fallible and how can they made, be made less fallible. And the, one, the key of their argument is that humans speak or write not to communicate information, but to persuade others. It's all about the relationship between you and your conspecific. You know, whether to get them to do something, like come and give this talk, like the wish had to convince me. We tried more, more, more than once, 
uh, eventually persuaded me. Uh, so his message to me was not inf just information, it was just trying to entice me to come and do this talk. Um, and furthermore, often people when pose the problem, they give a wrong answer. A, a very, you know, kind of quick and typically wrong answer. If they are challenged in a constructive way to explain their reasoning, for example, they may actually get back to understand where they went wrong. So the interactive protocol between us about explanations, justifications, where we just, you know, you know Luis wanted to, me to come and give this lecture. Um, I might want to delay because I, I was worried about COVID, say. You know, I might say, oh, you know, I'm too busy, whatever, whatever. All right, I will give you him some ex plausible explanation, even if maybe it wasn't the right one, maybe I didn't have a, a talk ready or something. Uh, so we had this model that learn from overt language written on the web and so on and so forth. Are they re really modeling the mind or is it modeling how we kind of persuade each other, sometimes fool each other? So that's something to think about. And the last one is this book that I'm still reading, I haven't finished, Language Versus Reality, Why Language is Good for Lawyers and Bad for Scientists. Uh, which just, the subtitle is actually part, it's kind of very much along the same lines and it has beautiful examples of the mismatch between language and the reality. In fact, the reason I put the image examples before is because one of the things that his points out and explains and gives a lot of evidence for, Enfield does, is that our ability, you know, the, there's such a gap between our, the poverty of our language and the richness of our perceptual field, and nevertheless, our perceptual field is completely impoverished with respect to, say, this electromagnetic spectrum and the auditory spectrum. I cannot hear anything above probably 15,000 hertz, right? You know, the, you know the, the dog next door will hear into 30,000 hertz. But even that, I cannot describe sound to you anything like I can recognize it. I can, look in, you know, I can say, oh, this is like rather mellow. What does that mean? You know, you might have a very different idea of what mellow means. So just conclude, I'm kind of confused. On one hand, these modeling techniques that are going to continue to grow are being going to be more and more getting at how we use, exploiting the fact that a lot of the language that's out there is out there for a purpose, and those purposes are very common across all of us. Persuasion, explanation, commenting code, you know, arguing about politics, whatever. But on the other hand, if you look at the cognitive linguistics and cognitive science, we see this disjunction between language and the other forms of cognition. And this risk that if we just tr use language to train these models, we are going to create th models that pretend to know things they don't really know. And it reminds me of, you know, as a young person reading some kind of book about, say, the, I, I love to write, uh, read ex uh, Arctic exploration books when I was a kid. I hadn't even, I hadn't even seen snow in my life, right? And yet I read it, so I had all these imaginations about snow and ice and fr what's frostbite? I've actually had frostbite my nose from a climbing expedition, so now I know, but I, I, I cannot know what frostbite is until you actually experience it, really. So, where are we? Yes, that's a big question for all young people there is, hey, you know, it seems great, but ooh, you know, there are these gaps. Will, how will these things behave, you know, on our behalf when their knowledge is only acquired from what we say publicly, which probably is a little bit deceptive sometimes. Thank you.
Okay, we have some time for questions. Thank you for this very inspiring talk. It appears that current AI is using, consuming quite a lot of energy done with uh, computers and GPUs. Uh, which technology do you think is going to allow us to use uh, advanced AI in a sustainable way in the future? Great question. Um, I'll say two things. Uh, there's actually a paper by a bunch of colleagues of mine that uh, was put out in our archive a few months ago that goes kind of deeply into this question and, uh, and uh, it examines the different uh, uh, trade-offs and the different types of computer architectures and other ways of, of uh, minimizing the, the energy footprint of training these models. Uh, I don't have the numbers in my head and uh, I, they did, a, I think, a good job of uh, characterizing the state of the art. Now I'm going to talk about my, my kind of completely ungrounded opinion in the sense I, I have know nothing about particles or very little. I think that it's completely strange that we do these things by multiplying and adding floating point numbers. You know, if you think about, you know, what we know about neuroscience is that our brain, you know, this thing is even right now working hard to answer your question, is consuming like 20 watts, right? And, uh, you know, we're, there's some big, many orders of magnitude difference. And my naive take on it is when a neuron is not firing, it's using very little energy. It just kind of still has to metabolism to stay alive. But it is not producing this big, you know, this big biochemical process to, to propagate its life down, down the axon. And, and whereas, when these things are working, even if they are not doing anything, if, if the activations are all zero, or about zero, they're still using the same amount of energy. You know, a floating point calculation does not depend too much in energy consumption to, to which numbers you're going to multiply. That's wrong. It's wrong, I mean, it's kind of wrong. It, it makes me feel very sad that we cannot do things that. Now, is, can we create spiking neural networks in silicon? Eh, maybe, maybe not, I actually, <laughs> I uh, have one, someone in my team working on exploring that possibility, working with others. Uh, I would love to see that, you know, energy aware, you know, artificial neural computation can make a big progress. I, I'm skeptical of some of the work in that area for, for the reasons I'm going to, but, but I think that's, that's an important direction. I, I, not, not just probably the, look, the energy reason is a good enough reason, a very important reason. But it's also because I mean, for 540 billion parameters, that is at the limits of computation that we can do. And we have a lot of computers, right? Uh, and uh, it's very challenging, you know, things go wrong all the time. Uh, there's, there's like a babysitting of the data centers to make this possible. Uh, I want, look, we want to have something like that in my pocket. The only way we're going to do that is complete, radically different neural architecture both software and, and hardware. Yes, uh, thank you for your very interesting talk. Um, given that uh, one of the known problems of uh, artificial intelligence uh, uh, has been uh, a lack of context, uh, especially compared to the human uh, reasoning, uh, my question is, that, uh, given this uh, huge amount of, of uh, data that uh, this uh, Palm uh, the system uh, got uh, compressed, as you say, without any reasoning uh, capabilities uh, of the system itself. Uh, do you think that uh, one of the, the features of AI that uh, we notice that are the catastrophic errors with the little uh, changes in inputs, uh, do you think that this can be compensated by the, this uh, huge amount of data in spite of the lack of, of, of reasoning of the system, or, uh, well, I'd like to hear you say. So, so, oh, this is a great question, and I, I'll just say one thing. Which, the thing which surprised me most with Palm is how good it is. I didn't expect it, and of course it, it does fail, uh, and I, I, I'll just give, give a very naive view of why it's that good and can do things like that, and lots more like that. 
let, let what I show you. It's because it's activation vector. If you think about all the, the, the activation vectors that the model, a huge transformer model contains, is huge. And therefore, it can segregate different pieces of information, which was not possible with smaller models. When you keep the same, um, you know, these pieces of information apart, you have much less chan chance of crosstalk between them and catastrophic failure. That's intuition. Now, do I have empirical data on that? I don't. It is actually a very important area of research is understanding when these things fail. But let me go back to the practice, because this is more speculative. When we worked with the search team at Google to use BERT for such ranking, um, and one of the things that they first started doing is examining, you know, kicking the tires, hitting BERT to all sorts of examples, including adversarially constructed examples, which they had, because they, of course, they've been managing search for 20 years. They know which way search can go wrong, so you can actually use those cases and try to see, look for catastrophic failures. Yes, they found them. And as a result of a very elaborate and long process, which is why BERT was, it, you know, it took basically two years from when BERT was developed inside Google and how when it kind of the search ranker based on it showed up to the outside world, is figuring out how to evaluate, how to probe this system to see where it could go wrong. Essentially, throwing all sorts of counterfactual examples at that. In fact, the, the, the team that does that developed a really interesting set of technologies to essentially do uh, external, you know, looking at a model like this, like a black box, and trying to find the ways in which it fails. So, very much like, if you think about, say, civil engineering, you know, so my, my first job at, at, in my career when I was still a student, first as a technical and then a, 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 a particular sciences was helping um, civil engineers with their code. And I remember back then the structural programs they had, structural engineering software they had, it was very limited, could do some very simple types of structures. For everything else, what they do is do, do a scale model and put it on, you know, a bang on it, you know, you know, seismic tables and so on and so forth, put, you know, static weights, dynamic uh, uh, impulses and so on, and analyze the, be the behavior of the model. I think we are at that stage with respect to these types of models. We, we cannot quite, we don't have a mathematics of how they fail. Uh, you don't have something equivalent to say what signal processing theory does for say uh, electro circuits that allows you to do modeling with spice without ever building the thing. You cannot do that with these models, you have, but you can build them and then subject them to a, a rigorous test regime uh, and semi-automated to try to find their fatal point. Does that help? So, so basically we are at the stage that civil engineers were, the, the people that build, I mean, and so go back to my civil, hanging out with civil engineers story, right? Now, the people that build um, some of the biggest dams and bridges in Portugal back in the, for designed them back in the 40s, 50s, they could not model these things. They had to rely on their intuition and their detailed models. Those things still stand. Ponta Rabida is a great example. Uh, and, and that is, I think, the state we are in with respect to very large neural models. We have. Uh, thank you. Um, the language, so all the description of the reasoning of the uh, language, we would say it's our explicit knowledge, while what is still missing is the tacit knowledge that from other areas of research is now being studied a lot through reenactments, reconstruction, so they will result in images, videos. Is this kind of information also uh, being introduced or it's only words? So, so two things. Uh, first of all, in a, I, I think the distinction between the overt and tacit, tacit knowledge is a little bit misleading because there's a lot in the, if you look at, again, the book is great, Enigma of Reason. If you look a lot of what goes in a dialogue 
a persuasive dialogue. There's a lot of tacit knowledge in it. And these models are powerful enough to actually get at some of that. Uh, like, uh, you know, uh, I, I, I don't remember the example now, but you know, one of the examples is clear that there's a fill in the blank of some kind, something is not explicit, right? Now, now should we try to incorporate imagery and, and so on? Absolutely, and in fact, you know, the example I, I gave you, the question, the, the, the image caption is part of a bigger project that is trying to bring these things together in a unified way. I, I'm a bit skeptical though, maybe but I've been wrong before, that I, we can build models that understand not, not just sort of simple binding of terms to pieces of an image, say, but things about the tacit knowledge we have, for instance, about geometry of a real life. So, you know, you know, knowing that this thing, if I do this, is going to look the same. Or if I open the, the, the top and do that, the water will end up on the ground. I am skeptical that we can do that from purely passive observation. But I've been wrong. I never expected these models to be this good at this point, right? So maybe I'm just kind of too in unimaginative about that. Hi, thank you for the great talk. Um, so we're reaching a point where companies are making very huge models and we are able to fit data in models in large computing units. So the question is, what's the limit for data compressors? Because this is what they seem that they are doing. They are not truly intelligent systems. Uh, there will be a time where we'll be able to fit the entire language, wrong, correct language and wrong language um, in a processing unit and it will be able to compress it. And what then? Where do we go? Where do we go from there in terms of artificial intelligence? So, uh, I, I, first of all, I, I want to mention there's a, there's a, a line of research in cognitive neuroscience uh, that goes by the name of predictive coding. They think, and these are not AI people, these are, these are neuroscience people, they think that prediction is all there is, right? And if I can predict what I'm about to observe, I can do, you know, it's all I need. It's not them, it's not me, it's them, right? Uh, so it's not just that, it does. so I, I just want to say that this idea that, and I mean, if I started with this work that, uh, that I mentioned with the Tishby and Lee, which is information bottleneck, and that is also inspired by this idea, right? In the more creating representations that are predictive what we care about, is what, where, what life is about, right? You, 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 you know, cells that even, you know, the small unicellular organisms in a sense have to represent their environment uh, so that they can interact, you know, live in it and not, not uh, in a certain way. Now, is that, what would not, when people say, oh, it's not true mark of intelligence, I, I, since I, I have no idea what intelligence is, uh, I just observe that the kinds of things that the, you, I show you there with Palm, they are not human-like in the sense that when you fail, there are certain different ways that the human would fail. But they are kind of surprisingly intelligent if you look at them naively in a sense, right? So I would rather say what is it that we would like an, a machine to do for us on our behalf that this thing cannot do, right? And I'll give you an example. This thing cannot drive a car. This thing cannot operate the lights in your house. This thing cannot cook for you, right? And there are lots of things you would like it to do but it cannot do. And one of the big reasons it cannot do is that they don't have a way of binding, you know, descriptions of actions to actual actions and monitor the results of that action. You know, have the right feedback loop to say, oh, oh gosh, you know, you know the, the oil is burning on the pan, you know, throw a blanket over it, right? You know, it's just not 
even if it knows that this is what you do, if you have a fire in your kitchen, it just doesn't know what to operate the environment to achieve that goal, right? And that question of interaction with the outside world, the world outside the language, is the key one that distinguishes, to me, intelligent behavior, whether it's intelligent behavior by a human or intelligent behavior by a bird, do, from, uh, you know, kind of compressions of passively acquired intelligent behavior. So you look at intelligent behavior, traces of intelligent behavior, you suck the juice out of it, and you, we can actually simulate it pretty well to some extent, but we cannot really do it. There's a difference between simulation and action in the real world. It's like a big disjunction. Like some people, of course, think that we all live in a simulation, but those of us who kind of have broken several bones over our lifetimes kind of think that maybe we are not living in a simulation. Okay, so uh, let's thank again uh, our speaker for the wonderful talk.